thank you for coming to our talk. So Theodore and I are with Consensus, and over the past six months, basically, we've been working on uh, the ZK EVM. Uh, so pretty much ever since we published a preliminary version of the spec uh, on E3 search around Christmas. So this will be providing you with a look inside uh, the ZK EVM as it exists uh, today. So here's the outline of the talk. Uh, we'll describe our approach to the ZK EVM. Um, we'll give a quick look into the arithmetization, so um, the modular structure, execution traces, constraints. Uh, then we'll talk, uh, uh, Theodore will uh, take over and start talking about uh, our actual implementation. The highlight of the talk should be the fourth section, which is a demo where we will be running uh, Uniswap v2 on our ZKVM and performing a swap. And we'll conclude with a very short outlook uh, at what's to come over the next few months. Okay, so there are basically two main uh, ways of doing a ZK EVM or a ZK VM in general. Um, the first approach is to uh, take uh, Solidity and to compile it to a virtual machine, which is maybe optimized for zero knowledge proving purposes. So this is not the approach we took. We want it to be uh, fully compatible with EVM bytecode as it exists today. And so what we set out to do is uh, to be able to prove the execution of EVM bytecode, um, native EVM bytecode, in a zero-knowledge proving scheme and be fully compatible with uh, uh, the Ethereum yellow paper. So one of the advantage advantages is that it allows us to reuse existing developer tools. So here's how we envision uh, the workflow of our ZK EVM. So, uh, there's going to be a, a ZK EVM client. Uh, it will be acting pretty much like a layer one node, receiving transactions, forming blocks. The blocks are then sent to uh, an execution engine. Uh, in our case, it is Go uh, Geth, which executes a block and uh, sends uh, data which it generated along the, the path to the ZK EVM. So this is where our work uh, starts. Uh, the ZKVM is basically tasked with forming the execution traces, and this means, first of all, organizing the data. So we have this modular architecture, which we'll be talking about in a second, but which we've, you've already heard about this morning. Um, and the second most important part is expanding the data. So only a tiny minority of the data which lives in the ZKVM is actually obtained from the, the client directly. Once all of this is done, uh, the data gets sent to the prover. The prover computes uh, more, more stuff, basically, uh, mainly the, uh, the parts that are there to witness the satisfaction of the constraints, so relationship witnesses. Uh, it generates commitments to all this data and then uh, packages all of this together into a ZK proof of the execution of uh, the EVM or the ZK EVM. Uh, once this proof has been generated, it gets sent back to the rollup and ends up on main uh, on chain. Okay, so um, our ZKVM is basically a collection of modules, um, modules that are tasked with specific parts of uh, the execution. So you have um, arithmetic, for instance. You have binary uh, word comparisons, which are, I think, self-explanatory. Storage and RAM. But uh, you have in the middle uh, the stack, which is which we call the main execution trace. So every one of these modules is basically uh, has its own execution trace. As we will see later, it's basically a big matrix of field elements. And these execution traces must satisfy internal constraints. Uh, and these internal constraints are module specific. They basically uh, enforce that every module performs the operations it is supposed to do. These modules are also connected one to another, so those are the arrows on the diagram. So you have uh, basically the, the main hub, which is the main execution trace that is connected to everything else. But some of the modules are split up into sub-modules, uh, arithmetic and RAM, uh, for instance, uh, there's a parent RAM and a child RAM. Okay, so uh, execution traces, as we said, they are basically big matrices. The number of columns is fixed, it depends on the module. Uh, the number of rows will depend on the block being executed. And only a tiny fraction of these uh, columns contain data that is extracted directly from uh, uh, the execution engine. Uh, 
uh, the remainder of uh, these columns is populated by us in the ZK EVM. Here's uh, a snippet of what you may imagine, for instance, uh, for the stack, the main execution trace. Uh, main, uh, yeah, main execution trace. So some of these columns um, um, probably make sense to most of you, like the instruction column that just lists the sequence of instructions being carried out, or the program counter and uh, pointer columns such as the top uh, read and write stack pointer that refer to uh, positions on the stack. Um, okay, now that we've talked a bit about execution traces, let's um, say a few words about uh, constraint systems. So when you look at our spec, our spec is written in a very high-level language, and we express everything in terms of um, um, readily understandable um, branching behavior in terms of ifs and else, uh, else if, this kind of stuff. Um, here, this snippet basically represents um, part of the spec that uh, um, imposes the behavior or imposes certain gas costs uh, associated to storage operations. And uh, you will also notice uh, tildes uh, pretty much everywhere. So we'll uh, say briefly something about this. This is about uh, something I'll mention on the next slide, which is the ability uh, or the, the necessity we have to sometimes reorder columns because some of the constraints are best expressed in uh, a different order. Okay, so we have this very high level description, but how do we make it uh, low level? Well, we use a host of um, uh, well-established tools and techniques to make the high level approach basically uh, transfer, transpile it or decompose it into very low level uh, relations. So for instance, uh, in order to express branching behavior, we require the introduction of auxiliary columns that allow us to test for the nullity or non-nullity of certain values. Uh, we already mentioned uh, we require row reshuffling, so there are classic standard tools now to do this, like grand product arguments. Certain of the constraints are best expressed when we have the ability to reorder rows of these execution traces. For instance, for ins enforcing storage consistency, it is most easily done when we are allowed to stack in chronological order all the accesses to a given storage key of a given smart contract. Uh, for instance, when verifying that a value which was loaded uh, coincides with a value which was previously stored. Um, so some of the modules require also uh, uh, like byte decompositions, for instance, uh, or uh, 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 as, uh, or the ability to order certain values in a column in ascending order. So for this we employ uh, range proofs which uh, are in the style of the ones uh, done by Cairo. Um, uh, we already mentioned these inclusion proofs for linking the different modules uh, together. So the ability, this allows us to transport values from one module into another. But we also use it uh, for instruction decoding uh, we get basically cheap, relatively cheap flag decompositions for instructions. Uh, we also have uh, the ability, well, we also use it uh, uh, for its ability to, um, for lookup tables basically for certain operations that are hard to arithmetize, like the binary operations uh, or the comparison, word comparison operations. And uh, we should also mention that uh, we want to be compatible with BN254. So this forces us uh, to also do some word splitting uh, in order to avoid uh, otherwise inevitable uh, overflows. So this part of the arithmetization was the part uh, which, um, if you are familiar with uh, what other projects are doing, you would expect to find uh, some of the part of the arithmetization are far less uh, straightforward. Uh, for instance, uh, what we do with RAM and the RAM and the stack uh, is less uh, obvious. So we already, already mentioned that the RAM module is decomposed into two parts, and this is because uh, in the EVM we need to be able to access individual bytes uh, of the RAM because it's um, word to byte basically addressed. Uh, but we have chosen for succinctness reasons that uh, we basically address word to word. And so in order to have the functionality which is expected uh, by the EVM, we need a module that basically takes care of the slicing and splicing of, uh, of words to be able to access bytes. Uh, 
Um, for instance, uh, another thing which is not so obvious is um, how we deal with the stack. So we need to be able to navigate in the stack uh, and to return certain, to remember certain pointer values for whenever we have returns uh, of function calls. So we basically model in the background, we have this um, sort of uh, object, which is the most compact way to uh, assemble into one object uh, the totality of the data and the pointer uh, data that uh, refers to uh, or that describes basically what will happen on stack during a block. And these columns, which we already encountered earlier, like top, RSP, etc., implicitly refer to this object. Um, and yeah, for instance, uh, I mentioned the ability, uh, we need to be able to navigate back uh, to certain values of the program counter or the top pointer uh, for stack, for instance. So we have columns as well that are dedicated to this. Um, so uh, I'll hand it over to uh, Theodore now, who'll be talking about the implementation. Hi, everyone. So for the implementation, uh, we have basically three main parts of it. Like we have first the assignment generator that traces the EVM and generate execution traces, but for the ZKVM. It's, I mean, currently we are using the get, get library because we have coded our ZKVM in Go, but I mean, it, is, it uses the tracer API and can be independent from the get library. It can use also Besu or I don't know. We have also compilation utils uh, to allow us to build low-level assignments and constraints uh, the way Olivier described it before. Uh, and so actually, since we have like almost thousands of equations we have to verify and megabytes of data we have to produce, it really abstracts away a lot of the complexity of the ZKVM. Uh, then we have the trace checker or the verifier that checks the ZKVM execution traces against the ZKVM constraints, okay? So for now, we have stopped here in the implementation. Then we still have to produce the proofs, like the ZK proof, and so this is where the ZK part gets in. But um, it is already a very difficult thing, like to basically specify the whole EVM, which are, we, I mean, which has a very weird behavior in a lot of cases, so, we are going to showcase uh, how we have done it. So basically, we have chosen really to remain as close as possible uh, to the specification we have published a few months ago on Ed Research, um, and we are going to publish actually another one when we have um, completely arithmetized uh, the whole ZKVM like in a few months. Uh, so you can see, for instance, on the right side of the screen, we have, um, I mean, an extract of the specification, and on the left side you have the, um, I mean, implementation part that match uh, this uh, part of the specification. And so what is interesting to note is that we have a very close, uh, actually, correspondence between these two high-level languages, which allows us, actually, to really simplify the way we define and build our ZKVM. Then we um, compile uh, all this data and all these constraints into our very low-level language, like polynomial language, uh, which, I mean, uh, is only basically equations um, that are verified with polynomial um, objects. So it can be done independently from smart contract execution, so you can do it after having tracing all the data. And you don't need, actually, to dump all this uh, auxiliary data we generate after the compilation step. Like, uh, we have several layers of compilation. Uh, we generate space-ordered columns, so it's for memory integrity. It's the tildes one. Uh, we compile high-level language representation to polynomial equations. So we have like, a lot of stuff that we use to abstract away the complexity, like conditional statements, interleaved columns, or macros and helpers that we can use really to simplify things. And then we also reduce the degree of the polynomials because we have high degree, high degree polynomials and we have constraints on the FFT domain size, but it's like a very technical stuff that I won't I mean, get into. Um, okay, so now the interesting part for everybody, we are going to deploy, run, and prove Uniswap v2. Why Uniswap? Because it's uh, like, smart contract, and actually it's a set of smart contracts uh, that is widely used uh, by the community. And 
Also, another thing that is interesting is that it involves smart contract composition, which is not an easy thing to do, actually, um, in a ZK uh, proving system. So we wanted to, be, to keep it as simple as possible and keep the existing contract deployment workflow. So we are using GEF, uh, GEF like as an execution uh, machine and Truffle uh, to basically deploy and migrate the contract. So we are going to deploy the contracts in three different steps. First, we create, deploy the contracts on a GET node, which is actually a rollup that has GET plus uh, things to generate uh, ZK EVM assignments. Um, so we have the Uniswap core contracts. We also mean two ERC20 tokens, so we, that we have called token A and token B. Uh, and what's interesting, actually, is that the contracts are coded in Solidity. And this is the Solidity version that was deployed on-chain originally. So it's like V0516. We are not bound to any Solidity version since we are um, EVM equivalent. Um, so then we are going to create a swap pool, add funds to it, and then perform a swap. Um, OK, so it will be interesting if we can prove that these steps were correctly executed. And actually, it is the purpose of a ZKVM. So at every step, we generate execution traces using the GEF tracing API. And then we check that the data pass the constraint system. If it was successful, then the execution was correct. Um, OK, so the demo steps. We have the first two steps that I have presented. And then I will modify some data of one of the execution traces so that you can believe me that we actually check something. Like, um, then, I mean, if we modify some of the data, uh, actually the constraint should not pass anymore and the thing should break. So let's see what happens. OK, so I'm going to go to my IDE, so VS Code. Uh, and first thing, I'm going, I'm going to launch the get node rollup. So, I have a comment for that. OK. So basically, I compile GEF, and then I launch the node. So OK, the, launch, the node is launch, launched, sorry, and I can interact with it uh, with the GET console. But we are going to use uh, Truffle, since it's what people do uh, in real life. <laughs> OK, so let's go to um, another terminal window, and Let's launch Truffle Migrate. Um, OK, so it will start uh, compiling the contract, but since we have already done it, you don't need to compile anything. And then you are going to see, so if you see my mouth, mouth on the left side of the window, we have a trace folder. And in this trace folder, we are dumping every transaction data um, that we generate during the execution of uh, the smart contracts. And so this transa transaction data will be then used uh, in our ZKVM system to check that the constraints are passing. Uh, what is interesting is that actually we prove not only the execution of transactions, but we also prove that the contract, uh, contracts were actually well deployed. So this is quite interesting. So we prove the deployment and the execution of contracts. Uh, so you see we have like five or six different contracts we have to deploy. Uh, so it's taking some time. Um, OK, so then let me use Truffle to execute the first script, um, which is basically uh, to add funds or liquidity to a swap pool and um, basically create a swap pool. OK, so uh, you can see on the left side of the screen, same thing, new transactions are appearing we execute new stuff. Um, OK, so you can see here in uh, my terminal that the user balance was updated. So it seems that it worked. Uh, let's perform a swap then. OK, so I'm swapping the tokens. And so the user balance should update. It was updated, so it seemed to work. Uh, let's have a look very quickly at the traces we have generated during the execution. So you can see it's basically like Olivier showed you, it's basically like very huge arrays of numbers um, and they 
represent, represent a lot of data that we collect from the execution and that we can use uh, in our ZKVM. Uh, let me just, before I check uh, the constraints, let me just um, have a quick look at the size of the data we generate. You see from the last two uh, lines that we generate almost megabytes of data. So I'm going to verify that everything was performed correctly. It should pass. Um, and if it passes, uh, then it means that the execution uh, was successfully, uh, I mean, um, ha has, been su um, has been successfully performed. Okay, so it was successful, which is pretty good news, actually. Uh, so let me change one or two things uh, in the transaction data. For instance, I will change the program counter value. Uh, so right there, I know, I, I will change this value, and I'm going to put uh, 49, let's say. Okay, let's verify that um, if, it, if it breaks, and you see that there are a lot of um, scary lines that appear on the screen, which means that uh, actually it failed. Because I have modified some data and I shouldn't be able to, and so the verification failed. And let me show you, actually, because I talked about it, uh, where, which part of the spec uh, was failing. Um, so I think it's a bit um, down. So yeah, it's main execution trace, but act actually because we have like almost a hundred of pages, so <laughs> I have to be able to move quite fast. Uh, okay, so it's this constraint that is breaking. Actually, it says that we have to increase the program counter by one if we have, I mean, any instruction that is not jumps or stuff like that. And you can see here that we have this very uh, constraint that we had in the spec. Um, okay, so that's all for me. I'm handing back the mic to Olivier. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, okay, so very quickly, um, what is still missing and what uh, is coming up in the next few months? Uh, we are still missing a few instructions which we will be adding. For instance, we the revert instruction is a very complex one, and so we have it arithmetized to some extent but we haven't implemented it currently. We're not supporting currently also precompiles and logs, but all of this uh, will be added uh, over the next few months. Um, by the way, uh, we will be publishing our code in our full spec uh, probably around the same time as we are done with this. And uh, the next big step is to plug all of this into a proving uh, system. Um, and uh, we have ideas on how to do it, um, but um, it's still a bit in flux currently. So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Super impressive. I mean, wow. <laughs> um, um, we've got time for one quick question before we move to the next presentation. Any takers? Yes. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Um, what are your plans for handling precompiles if you already thought about it? Um, it should be part of separated modules that we include in our ZKVM through PILUCAP inclusion proofs. Uh, that's what we uh, aim to do. And actually, precompiles would be specialized circuits uh, that uh, execute. I mean, the same instruction, but in an optimized way, like uh, the, I mean, yeah. So you already, <laughs> so already thought about uh, which module are you going to use, or what process are you going to use for handling like BN254 BN uh, operation, for example, or things like this? Right, right now, we have not uh, thought about it yet, like uh, at least ex extensively. Thank you very much. All right, thank you again. Thank you. Um